Can you just give me the word? Here? You're, you're going? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so my name is Alex Bagulis. I'm really excited about this presentation. It'll be on free will uh, and Sam Harris. So Sam Harris, I don't know if you all are familiar with him. He's um, a popular atheist writer. Um, a couple months ago I did a presentation on his book, The Moral Landscape, uh, in conjunction with John Mackey's book, um, Ethics, Inventing, Right, and Wrong. Um, so now we'll be looking at Free Will. Um, it's a pretty short book, um, counting pretty much all the pages, including index and whatnot. It's 83 pages, um, not a lot of words on the page. Um, and some of it is in the moral landscape. And by that I mean I think there's chunks from the moral landscape that are here. Um, Ten dollars from Barnes and Noble, if you're interested. Um, so the majority of the book is dealing with free will, surprise, surprise, and then he talks just a little about how um, his view um, would affect our conception of moral responsibility and a few other issues. Um, given the argument that I presented in my last presentation about morality and whether or not uh, moral properties or moral values actually exist, in which I argued that we have good reason to think uh, that they don't, or even if they did exist, we wouldn't have access to them anyway. Um, I'm, just, I'm not going to talk about whether there's an effect on moral responsibility, because I don't think we should think that there are moral values, let alone responsibility uh, in regards to that. So his argument for moral, uh, excuse me, for free will is, um, well, again, it's against free will. He doesn't think there is free will. He thinks it's an illusion. And his argument for that is pretty simple. Um, we live in a world where uh, different events occur, and those events are all the result of prior states of the world. So um, if a leaf falls from a tree, that is the result of the physical state of the leaf, um, and let's say wind or whatever that strikes it, and the leaf falls. And at every stage, we can point to some prior state of the world to understand why the leaf fell. Um, right? That's essentially, or part at least, of what science is, uh, figuring out why something happened, and what we can look at is uh, the way things were, and take into account physical laws, and then we have an explanation of why things happen. So, our thoughts, our intentions, our choices are all events in the world, um, right? They have a physical explanation, they're not some mystical thing. Um, so they have a physical explanation, and since everything physical has a explanation in terms of physical laws and prior states of the world, likewise with our choices, our intentions, and our thoughts, our, our mental life, so to speak. So when someone chooses to you know, buy a book, right? they go to Barnes & Noble, they first decide to get in their car, then they decide to stop at the red light, um, you know, and they drive all the way to Barnes & Noble, they see the book, they choose to pick up the book and then go to the register, um, right, intending to pay for it, um, they take out their wallet, they do all these things, and we would say they have chosen freely to buy a book. Um, and in one sense, they certainly were free in that um, no one held a gun to their head or no one held their hand and dragged them and made them pick up the book, but as far as um, why they bought the book or why they chose to buy the book, that's all explicable in terms of atoms and how atoms interact and how atoms form cells and all things like that, but that's all just a question of how the world works, just like a leaf falling from a tree or uh, an internal combustion engine and that sort of thing. Um, so that's his argument for um, against free will. Um, I think it sounds pretty good. Um, 
And I guess before moving on, I just wanted to, maybe we could talk briefly about, you know, first of all, does that make sense? Does this argument make sense? And then um, other problems with it. Did it make sense? <laughs> <laughs> okay, got a guess? I'm having trouble grasping. Can you use it like an example, say, give us options, we choose one? Sure, I'm sure. guessing you're saying that it can all be explained down to the infinitesimal level. Sure, so... so That's my guess. Sure. So, um, you know, let's say I picked up the book, right? Okay, so now I have a choice. Um, I can put the book under my shirt and I can walk out. Um, or I can walk to the register and pay. Um, so it looks like I have two options, and I choose to take one of those options. Well, that choice is um, realized or caused by the physical and chemical state of my brain. Um, and the physical and chemical state of my brain is the, process, is the result of prior states of the world. Um, right, so what my brain is doing now, there's a reason why it's doing what it's doing now, namely that a second ago it was doing something else, and when atoms and cells and neurons and synapses all occur in a certain way, we get a result. Um, you know, it just trickles down. Um, so the choice is, it's a physical event, and it is explained by prior physical states of the world, and physical laws just like, just like anything else. So we might feel that we, um, you know, we, this choice is something that we created in a way that we brought out of nothing, but it's really an event, and it's an event explained um, by science, um, and so we look at how the world was, how the world interacts, in other words, scientific laws, um, and that explains why you made that choice. Does he explicitly give a definition for free will? Um, free will. Um, he. I'm sure, he did. And he, he may. One thing he says is um, two assumptions that people make. Um, so this would be in regards to free will, I think, is that each of us would have behaved differently, um, could have behaved differently than we did in the past. And two, that we are the conscious source of most of our thoughts and actions in the present. Um, but as we're about to see, however, both of these assumptions are false. So the first is false, um, right? So could we have behaved differently than we did in the past? Um, what he means is, if we're looking at, at something that happened in the past, could we have done something differently? Um, and the idea is no, because physical laws are the way they are. The past state of the world was the way it was, and that is why we did what we did. Um, so, you know, if a leaf falls from a tree, um, could it not have fallen from the tree if all the facts were the same, right? If uh, that leaf grew and everything and had the same nutrition and same life cycle that it did um, and the wind and all the other physical conditions were exactly the same uh, as they were, could the leaf have not fallen? Well no, the reason it fell was because of all those facts and because of the way the world works, so to speak. Um, so likewise with choices or uh, intentions and things like that. The reason we have intentions or thoughts um, is because of how the world was at that time and how the world works together with natural laws. Um, as for the second assumption, um, that we are the conscious source of most of our thoughts and actions in the present, um, well, it's the same idea. Our thoughts and actions are the result of physical, chemical pro uh, processes and uh, as such, we don't cause them, uh, we don't bring them about, they're brought about by what's going on in our brain, what's going on outside our brain and affecting our brain. Um, but we're not some transcendental ego 
you know, doing something. Um, I mean, it, it certainly feels like we're the ones making these choices. Is he basically saying that that's illusory? And I mean, you say we're not the ones making these choices, but I mean, it's not like somebody else is doing it. I mean, it's our brain interacting with the world. So couldn't, in a way, you say that it is us just before we're consciously aware of it? Sure, sure, sure. So um, dealing with, uh, you know, it feel, so it feels like we have. It feels like we have free will. Uh, so one thing he would say is if we actually, if we introspect and think um, about what actually goes on at every moment, um, he will say, um, well, we don't have the intention, or we're not aware of the intention, it's until it just pops into consciousness. Um, and likewise with a choice or things like that, right? We don't, um, you know, we don't know about the choice until it, it's just there. Um, so it doesn't seem like we're the cause. Uh, and even if, even if we think, well, okay, well this choice, I thought about it and then I came to that decision, I made that choice, even if that is true, um, yeah, okay. oh, you're fine. Uh, even if that is true, the prior intention, or the prior choice to think about and to deliberate, that popped in, you know, that just popped into our mind, popped into our conscious life. So it's, it's basically just an infinite regress back to the initial state of Sure. Of the universe at the sure. Um and, and as for the second or one of, one of the other issues you raise, um, if we want to say that we are the cause of our beliefs and intentions and all that, but not, we're just not conscious of it, um, in, a, in, a, in a real sense that's true, in that because we have a brain and because of the way it is, we have thoughts and intentions and choices and, and our brain and everything is obviously necessary to have that. Um, I don't think that that's what people mean when they talk about free will and stuff. They don't mean my body was responsible for my body doing something. So it, it's really the, the free part is the, is sure. the kicker here. So in order for it to be free, you have to, you have, to have some way of not, uh, if, like you said, of choosing some alternative. And, and there's also the issue of being the source of, mm -hmm. of the action. So, so uh, a second response to the same issue, so not only um, uh, the, the, the second half would be, even if our body and our brain does create thoughts and all this, does bring that about, um, the state of our body is the result of prior states of the world, right? So. The reason we are the way we are isn't because we somehow created something. No, it's because of however our parents came about, and then however you know we were formed at the moment of conception or whatever, you know, and nutrition and all that, and then outside influences and the state of our brain, which was also the result of prior states of the world. So even if we want to say you know our body is responsible, which it is uh, in a sense, it's not. Um, ultimately responsible, right? There's reasons why our body is the way it is. Um, it's not like our body is free to be otherwise. Um, yeah. It, it seems the problem with an absolute statement is that it's absolute. In other words, um, I had a really good friend of mine who's a Calvinist, and we have some, some great theological discussions, a brilliant Calvinist, but if you took what Sam Harris says, or even in neurology, or what B.F. Skinner said uh, in psychology, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, along with Calvin, all you have to do is insert. I mean, you just take Calvinism, it's predestination, and take out God and put in neurology. Or take Skinner and take out. In other words, who's doing the, who's, who has the presuppositions? We who think we're doing these actions, or Sam Harris, and Calvin and Skinner are presupposing that they're coming from someplace else. You see what I'm saying? Where, where would Skinner, where would they say that these things are coming from? 
Well, Skinner Skinner's position is that it's it uh, it's not necessarily a neurological thing, but it is is it's, it's a psychological thing that uh, that um, and a societal thing. Um, sure. In, in in the case of Calvin, it would be that God predestines. Um, in the case of in the case of uh, of Sam Harris, because he's a brilliant uh, neuroscientist, it would be the synapses is the, the neurons firing from the brain. Um, but there's, you know, there's obviously different views in neuroscience. Uh, the number one brain uh, neuro, uh, who got his uh, John Cleese, who got his uh, uh, got his uh, Nobel Prize in 1997, just said, you know, the self cannot be found in the brain, and therefore we don't have any evidence that we are our brains. So I, what I'm getting from Paris, as much as I respect his work, is. Is, a, is presuppositions and assumptions. Sure. So he's saying that we're assuming. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think the assumption we start with is that, um, you know, all causes are physical. Um, right, so there's no, there's nothing else that can do anything, right, in the world. If it's not physical, um, so what are the physical um, entities in the world? What is the world made of? What are the physical causers um, in the world? Atoms, right? And atoms interact in a certain way. Well, atoms or whatever is there. You know, if there's something more fundamental, that's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, so those things either interact in a law-like way or they don't, or sometimes it, you know. It's, Completely law-like, or it's not completely law-like, um, and from there we get things like psychology, society, right? So, you know, appealing to society. What I would say is appealing to society is just appealing to a physical state of the world, right? So, why does society act in a certain way? Well, we would look at prior states of the world, or or, or look at the way it is now. Um, Obviously, this would take a lot of information, right? We'd have to know. We'd have to look at the brains of you know every member of society, right? But um, right, if we could know all the physical information about society, um, we would know how society acts, or how it will act, or why it acts the way it acts. Um, so, and it's the same way with psychology, right? Psychology isn't. Um, well, hopefully, it's explained by you know how how the physical world. Um, how the physical world is and how it how it acts. Um, um, so yeah, I, mean, I think that's the starting presupposition, right? All causes are physical. So we, so you know, what I understand of Harris's work is that the biological imperative undercuts the concept of the existent individual. <clears throat> Can you explain what you mean by the biological? Well, that he's assuming this, therefore everything comes from that. But that's an assumption, because there's, a, there's so much aberration, and we're all individuals. We're all existent individuals. Sure. Like, uh, somebody has musical talent, and there's no particular phenotype to prove down the road that they're going to, that genetically is going to be passed on. Now, if your son has it, you know, or your daughter, well, it looks like it is, but there's no, you can't, there's no evidence, ultimately, that it, it you haven't found yet. Maybe I don't know. You know, I'm saying that there's these presuppositions um, seem to work against the concept of of individu the individual. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I imagine some. I, I don't know what Harris would say, but maybe he would say, um, you know, our thoughts. You know, they're given to us, metaphorically speaking. They, you know, they they pop into our consciousness, and. Um, you know, we also feel like there is some continuity uh, in our thoughts, um, you know, but the actual continuity, you know, whether or not there is really actual continuity, probably not. Um, and I don't know that he would, I don't think Harris would profess a problem with that position. So does the does the argument that that I present does that make sense? 
It does, but it seems like right off from it is a very Newtonian sense of how the world works, which I I I can this, so I automatically think of Newtonian is just an approximation. It's not the way the world works. I mean, quantum mechanics gives us have the it's all probabilities. It's there sure. is randomness, which I mean, I guess I kind of see as being free will. The option one way or the other. Sure. Um, so, so <clears throat> we could say that it um, seems like we have three options. Um, there is no law-like behavior in the universe, right? So that, that's conceivable, right? Just everything just happens and there's no law-like behavior. Um, or there's some and some random behavior, or it's all law-like. So in any of those situations, right, for any of those options, I think that exhausts the possibilities. Um, so, so let's say, um, I think we can agree that if everything's law-like, um, we don't have free will. Or at least that's the argument as I presented it. Um, but let's say there's some randomness in there, um, or it's, it just comes down to probability. Um, well, that's not going to get us free will. Right, because it's still the case that all causes are physical. Right, so anything that happens, it's still the result of prior states of the world. Right, um, and it's not. Um, well, yeah, I mean that's that's sufficient, right? That I mean that's really what we need is that um, what happens now is fully the result of prior states of the world. Um, and then, of course, if everything's random, it's really going to be hard to float free will. I totally grant that the state of the world now has... Uh, we are the sum of our experiences. We have experience in the past that affect today. Uh, well, when you say experience... Um, or the state of the world yeah. have an effect on modern state, current state. Um, well, I would qualify that. It's not that, that prior states of the world have an effect what? on current states of the world. It's that um, it is because prior states of the world are the way they are. There's nothing else that explains how we get to a current state of the world. Right? So now, if, the, if there's some, you know, something random going on here, you know, we have, you know, current state of the world, you know, and prior state of the world. Um, if it's all law-like from here to here, then clearly there's not some uh, free aspect. You know, there's not some freedom that is, that is making us go from here to here. But even if it's not, um, even if it's not uh, completely law-like, right? So even if there's, you know, a C1, you know, something else over here, right? Why we go to any one of these will be because of how things were here, and <coughs> that's it. Now this won't be sufficient um, to necessitate this. This state of the world won't necessitate coming to any of that, uh, any of these. But it'll still be the case that this is the only thing that we can look to for to understand why. Yeah, but we also could have circumstances in the past, the right combination of changes that we could have P2 V2 current C. So let's we say have an alternate past that it, with the right combination makes the current situation. So let's say we have a P2. That's, that's like the fate picture. No matter no matter what happens in the past, you end up on I'm not I'm not saying no matter what uh, it would happen. Sure, sure, sure. It's possible. Yeah, no, the, 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 the point isn't to say that no matter what happened in the past we would have come to here. Um, the point is that at any point, the reason that we are where we are is because of what happened in the past. So, so let's say this actually isn't what happened, and the prior state of the world actually was P2. That's fine, but the reason we're at P2 is because of, you know, the way the world was before P2. Right now, introducing a level of randomness just means that we can't, um, there's no explanation for part of it, right? 
I think, I think the randomness, like quantum mechanical randomness is different from randomness because you don't know why. Like it's, it's fundamental ran randomness. Sure. But still, if it's, there's a fundamental randomness factor involved, I think Harris talks about how it, it, doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to free will any more than a, a mechanistic, deterministic view. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's what you were saying, but... No, no, you're right. I mean, he says, if determinism is true, the future is set, and this includes all our future states of, the mind, of mind and our subsequent behavior. Um, and to the extent that the law of cause and effect is subject to indeterminism, so that's uh, what you raised, quantum or otherwise, we can take no credit for what happens. Um, there is no combination of these truths that seem compatible with the popular notion of free will. So, just because there's some uh, element of indeterminability, right, because of quantum mechanics or because of whatever, um, that's not us doing something. Um, I was wondering what you, if there's a specific definition of randomness in quantum mechanics, because when I think something happens randomly, it's arbitrary, and if even if there's some kind of random cause to our choice, that's arbitrary and that, uh, that we have no reason one way or another. That's what I think, so that wouldn't be much helpful to free will. Really hard to explain. Yeah. Randomness and I, I'm not sure that the, that the definition matters yeah. so much. I think this is what Max was getting at. I mean, in any case, it's indeterminism is what we need. So let's, we can just assume that whatever quantum mechanics does, it gets us indeterminism. So it's either deterministic or not deterministic, so indeterminism will not get us um, us doing something that um, we freely chose. Um, but um, I think this would be great, um, you know, Harris's argument, everything I've been saying, but I think we have to consider the possibility or the consequence that um, we have no reason to think that any of what he said or I said is true. Um, right, so, I mean, I said all this stuff. Um, it sounds good, and I think it sounds good, um, but it's not like we have a reason for thinking that it's good. Right, it's not like we have a reason for thinking that his argument was sound or cogent or anything. Um, Right, we don't have a reason for thinking that um, you know quantum mechanics is the way you know you stated it was um, right. There's not a reason for you know any of our beliefs. Um, the, the the evidence of of what we see and observe and contest doesn't doesn't give you a reason to believe it. Um, well. Our beliefs are given to us, right, by the state of our brain. Um, just like our choices or our intentions, um, right? So the reason, you know, you believe what you believe about where you parked your car is because of the state of your brain and the way the world works and maybe quantum mechanics. Um, Right? And your belief about your observations and your belief about your evidence, likewise, is formed in you um, right, by the state of your brain and the way the world works. So, and, and you will believe very strongly that you have good reason where you're to think and to believe that your car is wherever you believe you parked it. Um, but that confidence and that, that belief itself about being correct and having good reason, um, that's not something that, um, you know, some transcendental ego um, determined looking at the way the world was. No. Your brain formed that belief in you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that there's any, like, supernatural, you know, mind-body part of yeah. me that's taking credit for it. But, but there's still, I mean, the reasons that, that the, I mean, me being my brain, I'm not saying that there's something else there, yeah. but the reason that my brain has that belief is because of the reason of the evidence of where I remember parking it, right? Well, I mean, is your belief about the evidence, is that produced in you? As far as I know. 
Yeah, so, so if we assume that, um, you know, our beliefs really are, you know, the result of physical causes, right? Your belief about your evidence, your belief about why you believe you have evidence, your belief about um, observation, your belief about what you're seeing, the belief about what you're doing, um, right? That's all caused in you, right? J just as much as, you know, the person who thinks that you didn't park where you say you parked, right? His belief that you're mistaken is created in exactly the same way that that belief is created. Um, right? that, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a reason to think that, right? Well, I, I think so, right? Your belief is the way it is because of the way your brain is. It's not because you examined the evidence, right? It's because your brain is the way it is and the reason it is the way it is is because of, you know, P1 all the way, you know, down. Um, and so, the reason you believe, the reason you have beliefs about certain observation, you know, you, you believe that you saw your car, you believe right now that you were seeing a room, you believe that, um, you know, your car will not disappear, you know, you believe that um, it will work when you put the key in the ignition. Those beliefs are formed in you just as much as the person that um, believes some of those things aren't true. Right? They're, they're formed. Those, what I'm getting from Dave, and I'm sensing that he's, and I could and get, and correct me, Dave, but it seems like um, what Dave may be getting from Harris, or your presentation of Harris on this the subject, is that. Um, a sense of, of complete uncertainty whether a priori or a posteriori. In other words, both are all held in doubt. Uh, it's not... Those methods. You know, he said he's talking about, well, what about this kind of evidence that I have, whether reasoned or observable? Uh, I, think it, I think it goes deeper than, than all this, than, than that, right? It's no matter what we believe about a posteriori and a priori beliefs and evidence or whatever, um, well that belief about those very things, that's caused in us, right? So we might believe that um, there are a priori truths, um, but it's not like we can go check that. It's not like we can think about that freely somehow, right? Every thought we have about a priori truths it's just the result of how our brain is and how the brain works and how atoms interact with each other and how quantum indeterminacy, you know, came in and had something to do with it, um, right? So, you know, I think we're tempted to say, well, yeah, but, you know, I examined the evidence or I, I thought about it. Um, but, one, we have beliefs about us actually doing those things, right? So we have a belief that we checked evidence. Right? We have a belief that we thought about it, and we have a belief that a consequence follows from <clears throat> premises, right? So, you know, <clears throat> you know, A implies B, A, you know, therefore B, right? So I have a belief that, well, one, that I'm thinking about this, right? I have a belief that, um, if this is true, and if this is true, then this has to be true. I, I have a belief that logic works that way, but my belief is just given to me, it's just formed in me, right? So, you know, the person that thinks that, you know, logic doesn't work in this way, or, you know, let's say the person that, um, that doesn't see the problem, doesn't believe in a problem with um, uh, denying what is it? Affir yeah, denying the antecedent, okay? So we have the same thing. A implies B. Um, what is it? Not A, therefore not B. So I believe that this is false, right? This is invalid. Um, and there might be someone else that doesn't believe that. Their belief is formed in them um, in the same way that my belief is formed in me, right? It's just my brain is a certain way, and as a result of my brain being the way it is, I hold a belief that this is not good logic, 
it just won't stand. Um, but, you know, someone else who doesn't believe that, it's just for the same exact reasons, because their brain was a certain way, and because the world works the way it works. Um, right? So I'm not in some privileged position to say, well, no, 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 the way your brain formed it, that, there's something wrong there. Well, one, you know, how was that belief formed? How is my belief formed that you're wrong? Well, it was just given to me. Are you, are you making a case for global skepticism? Uh, I don't know that it's skept... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, if skepticism is thinking you have no reason for any of your beliefs, um, I suppose so. Right, but th this isn't a question about... Um, I just want to be clear, this isn't about skeptical scenarios, right? So the question isn't, are we really brains and bats or anything like that? You know, is an evil demon really, um, you know, messing with our minds and, and, and whatnot? No, the point is, um, simply, if the world is the way we say it is, right, then um, we don't have reasons for our beliefs. I'm trying to understand the, uh, the big picture of your objection. Are, are you basically... Well, it's not really an objection, but go ahead. Okay, so are, are you sort of pointing out that if what he's saying is true, then it's sort of self-defeating to try to convince people of it, or that the... The fact that you, you can stand here and present it to us is not offering us any sort of justification uh, for believing anything you're saying is true. Uh, well, for the second point, um, there's no justification for belief. I think okay. that follows. It, it, does that follow from what he said, though? I'm not sure it does. So you can you can think of justification as being in a brain state that bears or that stands in the appropriate causal relation to the world. Sure. So, because uh, my brain state that the formula on the left is uh, valid, it stands in the appropriate causal relation to the world, mainly that that's the one that actually is valid. I'm seeing it. Uh, sure. I heard you talk about it. So, my, my belief is caused by events in the world, and it, it's, no, no. it's causing my brain state in the right way. Yeah, so. What's, what's so, wrong with that? Yeah, so. Why, um, why isn't that a reason? Sure. So, so one. Um, so one clarification, and then I'll get to that. So first, um, one, I'm not questioning the existence of external reality, right? Um, right. So I'm not saying the world is vastly different than we believe it is. The point I'm trying to make is we don't have a reason for thinking that any of our beliefs are true. So if we take justification to mean um, our belief being in a certain relationship to the world, um, it might be true that some of our beliefs, it might be true that all of our beliefs, are in um, that state, right? It might be that, you know, it might be that this belief does not um, stand in the correct relationship to the external world. I, I, and that could be very true, but the question is... I, I just want to say it's 6.30 and we try to make an effort to break on time. If you need to go, go ahead and feel free to go. We can continue going as long as you guys want to. Um, I do want to say at 7 p.m., uh, if you guys want to, we're going to be meeting with the Columbia Atheists Group. They're meeting at Harpo's tonight. If you'd like to join us, there, you're welcome to. You can stay, and, and we can continue this as, as long as you want. I just want to say that. So, can Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, so while... Um, now let's go back to the you know, original one. A, B, A, therefore B. This might stand in the right relationship to the world. Um, but our reason for believing that isn't because we determined it looking at the world and made decisions and, and evaluated and things like that. Our reason for believing, so not only, so what I'm saying is not only is our reason for believing that this is true, not only is that belief formed in us just because of the way our brain is, but likewise, our belief that we are justified or that our belief, that very belief is in such and such a relationship with the world, that further belief is also formed in us. So, you know, so just as much as, you know, um, the person, you know, the pers a person can say, look, <clears throat> this is good, and it stands in the proper relationship to the world, and someone else says, no, <clears throat> this is good, it stands 
you know, my belief that the, and my belief that this is true, or my belief that instantiates this logic, or whatever, stands in the right relationship to the world. Well, these people's beliefs, they're the same, they're not qualitatively different in any relevant way. Right? They're both caused as a result of how the brain is, which also is the result of how everything was before it. Well, you can give the person who thinks the formula on the right, so you can give them a reason uh, to change their mind, namely a truth table, right? So then you're creating in them an observation, a brain state, bearing a certain causal relation to the world, you know, a chalk arranged on a chalkboard. And it will, if, the, you know, if they're updating in sure, sure. the correct way, then uh, I, I, they will now have a reason to think they were wrong and that the one on the left is the valid formula. Well, I, I think there's two, there's two, there's two issues with that. But so. I actually, I just don't see how this relates to uh, no free will, because I actually I'm sympathetic to the no free will position. For from the you know I call it the pincher argument, either determinism or indeterminism. If sure. determinism, no free will. If indeterminism, no free sure, will. Sure, sure, sure. But I, I just don't understand uh, the, uh, the 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 core of uh, this discussion as it relates to it. I think the core is that um, you know for the very same reason that there's no free will. Um, there's no... But, okay, but there are things we call actions, right? There, there are types of events that are caused by our brain. Sure. Right? So, similarly, there are reasons. There are types of brain states caused by... Sure. The world. Uh, I think that is re... I think the common notion of reason, which is what I'm, which is what I'm saying doesn't exist, is the idea that I believe something not because my brain gave me the belief, right? But is that, you know, I believe it because, um, you know, I looked at the evidence and I put it together and I thought about it and I can see that it's true, right? I mean, I think that's the common notion of when people say I have a reason for something. They don't mean simply to say, well, my belief made me believe that, or my brain made me believe that. Um, but to get to your truth table um, thing, so let's say, you know, I put up a truth table, um, a, B, A, B, you know, and we put it all, you know, we fill it in. Um, well, first of all, I grant that this action, right, might affect the other person's brain, right? So I might say, look, th look, this, this is all true, right? This proves that I'm right. You know, look, let your eyes see this. Think, think about it. And that person might change their mind, right? So, absolutely, um, we can cause right, our bodies and our brains can cause changes in other people's brains and other people's bodies. And I don't think you're disagreeing with that either. And I totally, I totally grant that. But um, our belief that this actually proves something, right? Or our belief that a truth table actually represents reality. Well, that belief itself is caused in us in exactly the same way that this belief was originally formed in the other person. Um, right? There's, a, and there's no privileged position, right? The person that, that believes this, they're not in some privileged position to say, well, I've examined how my brain formed the belief in me. I've looked at you know, the causal pathways, and you know, independent of that, I can tell you that you know, my, my brain causes true beliefs. We can't do that, right? Because you don't call, we don't form beliefs apart from our brain. Um, you know, and this person can give the exact same story, right? Um, you know, or if they gave this, if they gave the story, we would think they were wrong, right? Well, I stepped outside of myself and looked at the way my brain forms beliefs, and I can tell you that when my brain forms this belief, it's forming a true belief. Well, no, this person's belief about the truth of their belief in this. Well, belief is just caused in them. Um, like there's no there's no relevant qualitative difference between this person's belief and this person's belief. Um, well, actually, you know, you could use Harris his theory here to justify that Zen Cohen's have their own form of logic. You know, I, I, I know I, very little about that, but well, no, I, there's a great book by the Dalai Lama actually uh, called The Universe of a Single Atom. 
Okay. My son bought for me for my birthday a number of years back, and uh, it, 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 it was neuroscientist dialogue with the Dalai Lama, and it was quite interesting because the more I look at Harris's body of work, the more I see that he probably agrees more with the Buddhists than he does with the typical neuroscientist. And Seth and I were talking about this in the circle the other day. It's kind of, it, which I, when I wrote my, wrote my article on him and on the blog, so I just blog, somebody commented that, uh, that uh, he's going to become a black sheep if he doesn't knock this off. Uh, yeah. And the movement, well, you know what comment? No, 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 I didn't, I didn't make that comment. And I, I, I saw that. You know, that's probably right, you know. But I mean, that's okay because you've got to provoke thought. And uh, he, he, here's, here's my problem with, my problem with Harris. Um, in uh, the moral landscape, I think he absolutely missed the issue. Um, he, he wasn't even dealing, he's not dealing, he wasn't dealing with the problem of morality. Um, he totally missed the issue. Um, here, in this book, I think he was, um, for the most part, spot on. But um, what he needs to acknowledge is that his beliefs in neuroscience and his beliefs in physics and his beliefs about the physical world, um, he doesn't have reasons for those beliefs, right? He, he, I'm sure he feels very strongly that he does. I'm sure he feels very strongly that he is a rational, reasonable person. No, no, sorry, what? don't you think obtaining one's PhD in neuroscience uh, puts one's brain in the appropriate causal relation between uh, states of the world and, and brain states? So when, when you're st sitting in the classroom, it may not be uh, Certainty, like it, there may not be reasons that confer certainty, but it's at least tentative, provisional, uh, you know, with, with some level of confidence. Sure. Uh, those types of reasons. So I understand, I'm, I completely, buy, I, I, I'm with you that I can't trace back each of my brain states uh, and, and I examine their causal pathways, leading me to prefer the formula on the left versus the one on the right. But I do think I have uh, provisional reasons with you know, a, a high degree of confidence uh, in, for the one on the left, just based on uh, on what my, the, the way my, my brain states have been causally related to the world. Well, I mean, here, here's the problem. Um, I grant, you know, I might believe that you know he his PhD shows something, but me believing it, um, well, that belief is just that belief is formed in me by my brain, and likewise, your belief that your other beliefs stand in a certain causal relationship to the world, well, that very belief about that causal relationship, that belief is formed in you, right? So, so you know, the, the person who, you know, reads a crystal ball, you know, for a living, right, and, and maybe they're very sincere, you know, maybe there's someone out there that very sincerely believes that they read, you know, the crystal ball, and they very sincerely believe that they are in a certain causal relationship, you know, some looseness there, but, you know, there's some causal relationship with, you know, the netherworld. Um, you know, they will believe that very strongly, um, and they will believe, they might believe that they even have reasons for believing that, right? They might believe that, um, you know, on such and such a date, you know, such and such a thing happened, and that shows, and that shows something, right? So they'll believe that they have evidence, and they'll believe that that evidence, evidence shows something, right? So we have two beliefs, a belief about evidence and a belief about what that evidence shows. I, th I think we should make a distinction between having evidence or having a reason and believing that one has evidence and believing that you have a reason. So there's sort of an, ex an external, internal uh, s switch going on here. So in, you're, you, you're right that when I reflect on my sort of reasoning process, all kinds of errors are liable for the result uh, and, and all kinds of uncertainty arises. But if, we, if we're just talking uh, Externally, about just the, the causal relations, things we, sure. we as subjective agents don't have access to sure. those facts about the world. I, I so, absolutely grant that. I grant um, it could be that uh, our beliefs. There might be someone out there that has all true beliefs or that has 99% true beliefs. Um, we just have no reason to believe that. You know, if we spoke with every person in the world, we'd never have reason to believe that any of any belief that we heard was true. Right, so it, it might be true that, um, you know, I believe this is true, right? And, and it might very well be true, right? And my belief might stand in a certain causal relationship with the world. So you might have a reason, but you don't have a reason to believe that you have a reason. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at, well, but there I think we have two. We're using the word really no, in two it's, different ways. It's, it's two levels up, uh, I think. So there's, there's the direct externalist uh, reason where my, uh, my brain state is an inappropriate causal relationship with the world. But you would just never have reason to believe that that was the case. Right. So I don't have a reason to believe that I have a reason. And there, I think we're using the word reason in two different ways, right? I, mean, I thought I just repeated what you said. Well, it's one thing to say, um, I have a brain state, right? I mean, it, it, we can't exchange the phrase brain state, you know, for reason, right? So when I say I have a reason to believe, right, what we mean, I think what we mean in common parlance is I can tell you why, I can tell you why I believe that. Right, so why do I believe I parked my car there? Well, I'll tell you, the re I'll tell you why. Because I remember it, or because I did park my car there and I went through all the motions and I remember going through all the motions, or I can tell you why this is true. Well, well why, Alex? Well, look, here's a truth table. Right, that's my, this is my reason for believing that that's true. Um, now, if I were to say, well, my reason for believing it's true is because my brain is in a certain causal relationship with the um, with the world, um, well, one, I don't think that fits what people are looking for or what people mean when they say I have a reason. Um, I can tell you the cause, right, the cause of, I might tell you I have a reason and there's a, there's a cause for, for my belief. So the cause of my belief that this is because, uh, or the cause is the state of my brain and the way brains work and the way atoms work and whatnot. Because of the way my brain is, I have this belief. Which is, which is what I'm saying. Um, and what makes it true, what makes my belief true, is that my brain state stands in a certain causal relationship with the world. Um, okay, but why? Well, that's, that's but, not but, what makes the but, belief true. The belief is true just as that's the logical... Okay, sure, sure, sure. Sure. Um, the but, belief is justified in virtue of the causal relation. It Could it be true and not stand in the correct causal relationship? Oh yeah, you can you know get here uh, even without justification. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but the problem is ultimately is that anyone can say that. And here's where we get I think to the what we mean in common parlance when we say reason and what this more philosophical or, or whatever uh, concept of reason is, right? So the person that says this can say, well, look, the reason. I believe this is because my brain states stand in a certain way. I mean, if we want to go the external route, then we just have to say, um, when someone says they have a reason for their belief, and this is what I'm getting at, right, is when someone says they have a reason for their belief, um, we have just as much reason to believe them. We have just as much reason in common parlance to believe them as anyone else, right? So. If, if I tell you this, um, as far as what I can tell you, um, you're going to have just as much reason to believe this as this. Um, of course, the reason why, the, the cause of why you will believe this, or why you will believe this, is because of how your brain is and how brains work. Um, but um, I think defining reason as, as um, just the way, just a certain way that the brain is. Um, we're certainly not conscious of the way our brain is. Um, and even if we were conscious, our beliefs about what we were conscious of would just be formed in us. So, in conclusion, um, you know, I think Harris gets it right, but I think he has to, eventually, uh, if he wants to be honest with himself, he needs to realize that, you know, he doesn't have a reason for believing this, doesn't have a reason for believing this, um, right? Um, I think he has to accept that he has just as much reason for believing in atheism as the person that believes in voodoo believes in voodooism, the person that believes in Mohammed, uh, Christian, um, right? All those beliefs are on the same level. Um, now, that might be bad for his book sales, um, but um, I'm sure he could work a way around that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, any final questions? Are you going to Hogwarts? What? Are you going to Hogwarts? Um, that's night, that right after? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.